In 1987, the historians Gisela Merlenhof and Rita schlautmann Overmeyer began to make contact with Jews who had emigrated from Münster during the Nazi dictatorship. In the course of their work, they received a parcel with rolls of film from a man named Walter Gumprich, who had emigrated in 1939 with his parents. The film shows scenes from the life of the Gumprich family in the final years before they emigrated. Walter Gumprich has welcomed the publication of these films because they demonstrate that the Jews defamed by the Nazis were human beings like everybody else. Spring 1939. The Gumprich family are taking a walk. Everything seems completely normal. The children are even laughing. This social gathering in the Gumprich's garden was shot at the same time, and the people present seem to be in an equally good mood. There are no signs of depression in their faces. That said, the situation has been precarious for many years now. All the persons present at this gathering are of the Jewish faith. These pictures were taken by Siegfried Gumprich. He was a corn dealer and lived at number six Gravenerstrasse in Münster with his wife Luisa and his two children, Brigitte and Walter. It's relatively easy to pin down the exact date of most of the clips here. All the scenes in which the last rabbi in Münster, Dr. Julius Foss, and his wife Stephanie can be seen must have been shot in 1939. For this was the year in which the couple first came to Münster. Since the children shown in the various scenes are almost all the same age, the earliest shots can only have been taken in 1937. The sequences featuring the Gumprich family show scenes of the life of a Jewish family in Münster under the Nazi regime. Indeed, they were made during a period when the Nazi dictatorship had been in power for years, and the repressions against the Jewish population had already reached considerable proportions. That said, there are no traces of this in the pictures. Just like amateur filmmakers today, the Gumprich family primarily concentrated on the sunny side of life and were interested in making a record of friends and relations. So the film sequences mostly consist of holiday scenes, leisure and recreation. It's striking that there are no flags with swastikas, uniformed Nazis or even Nazi party events to be seen in the whole of the film. These were an everyday part of life in Münster and also in the daily life of the Gumprich family. It's only too clear that they had no desire to record this on film. These pictures are documents but they can only be understood if we consider when and in what situation they were taken. They could give an utterly erroneous impression of the life of Jews in Münster under the Nazi regime. For example, that all Jews in Münster were wealthy and that they also lived a comfortable life under the Nazis. 
the truth is that only a section of Jews in Minster were well off. Many were also small traders with modest incomes, or simply employees. Jews came from all walks of life. Nonetheless, the Gumpri family were considerably wealthy. This is immediately clear in the scenes showing them on holiday. Employees on modest wages could not afford a holiday in the Netherlands or a trip in their own car to the Rhineland. This sequence gives the impression of a modern upper-middle-class family whose father was in no way an authoritarian patriarch and whose mother was clearly self-confident and interested in sport. Siegfried Gumprich, shown here with his daughter Brigitta, was a dealer in corn and animal fodder. He had fought in the First World War and been awarded the Iron Cross First Class. His wife, Louisa, came from a merchant family and worked in her parents' textile business. Their daughter, Brigitta, was born in January 1932 and their son, Walter, on the 1st of March 1933, one month after Adolf Hitler came to power. At the time little Walter Gumprich was born, the Nazi party had already begun to stir up feelings against the Jews in Münster. At the end of March 1933, the Nazi party called for a boycott of Jewish businesses. Members of the SA stood guard in front of the shops. This was a first attempt to discourage the non-Jewish population from maintaining contacts with Jews. Lefman's textile business, which belonged to Louisa Gumprich's parents, was also hit by the boycott. At the same time, the Nazis initiated other actions to isolate the Jews and squeeze them out of public life. Jewish judges, lawyers, doctors, civil servants and university teachers were dismissed and their activities highly restricted. Furthermore, Jews were excluded from clubs and societies or pressurised to resign their membership. They were regarded as undesirables in many sporting venues. From now on, as can be seen in these sequences, Jews remained isolated amongst themselves. The following announcement was published in a local newspaper, the Münstersche Anzeiger, in summer 1935. The Münster Swimming Club, founded in 1891, excludes Jews. For some days now, visitors to the magnificent riverside site of the Minster Swimming Club on the River Verza have been met with a large sign, Entrance Forbidden to Jews. Members and guests are grateful to the club that has never had Jews as members since it was founded in 1891 for ensuring that Germans in need of recreation have been liberated from intrusive Jews. Louisa Gumprich was an enthusiastic athlete and a member of the Münster 08 Sports Club. Given the political situation, she set up a Jewish tennis club, which became an important meeting point for a section of Jews in Münster. In addition, the club invited other Jewish tennis clubs from places like Dortmund or Bielefeld to play against them. This certainly strengthened the cohesion of the Jewish communities, but it also served to isolate them even further from other Germans. The Nazis disseminated propaganda portraying the Jews as feeble. To counter this, the Jews set up their own sports clubs as a reaction to the sanctions and exclusions.
Thus, many of the Jews joined forces to resist the Nazi regime and try to lead as normal a life as possible amongst their own community. But the Nazi propaganda isolated the Jews further and hammered into the non-Jewish Germans that Jews were their enemies. The Nazis introduced a huge number of regulations and laws against the Jewish population. In 1935, for example, citizens' rights were made dependent on proof of being an Aryan. Furthermore, mixed marriages between Jews and so-called Aryans were forbidden. Siegfried Gumprich soon suffered economically from the repressive measures. The very existence of the Rosa wholesale corn merchants, whose co-owner he was, was threatened. The Nazis cut off goods from Jewish corn traders and lost them their customers. In a questionnaire dating from 1938, Siegfried Gumprich replied to the question, what was your income last year? No income. Thus, these pictures from a holiday taken by the Gumprichs in Holland in 1938 show merely a seemingly happy family, whose meager happiness consisted of being able to take refuge from the situation in Germany for a few days, to forget their problems and be able to move around freely once again without hostile reactions. In 1937, Henny Ullmann, a friend of the Gumprichs, wrote a letter from Scheveningen in the Netherlands in which she remarked, there are many Germans here who are happy to be able to breathe freely for a few weeks. We can feel the heavy pressure they're under at home, and strong nerves are needed to be able to endure the current times. Nowadays, we're astonished that not more Jews had emigrated from Germany by this time. But many people found it difficult to take such a drastic step, partly because older people no longer wanted to leave Germany, and partly because the future for Jews abroad was very uncertain. In addition, emigration was expensive. The Nazis only allowed the Jews to emigrate once they had paid a financial levy on Jewish property and the so-called Reich flight tax. Furthermore, the Nazi state imposed a levy on many of the objects which emigrants wanted to take with them abroad. In 1937, in response to a suggestion by a friend who'd already emigrated that he should leave Münster, Siegfried Gumprich wrote that emigration was too difficult. On top of that, he had no idea what work he could do in a foreign country. These pictures of Münster were taken by Siegfried Gumprich around this time and suggest that the Gumprichs felt deeply rooted in the region and loved Münster. For this reason, the very idea of emigrating remained highly theoretical. But in 1938, they decided to apply to emigrate to Trinidad. By this time, the Nazis had issued a protective decree to block all the accounts of Jews who wished to emigrate, and Siegfried Gumprich was forced to apply to the local tax office to release the necessary money to cover the costs of emigration. Nothing could be done without the permission of the Nazi state. The situation for Jews deteriorated drastically before the family were able to emigrate. During the night of the 9th of November 1938, Jewish families and property were attacked under the pretext given by the Nazi press of anti-Jewish protest meetings. Members of the SA destroyed Jewish businesses, broke into the homes of Jewish families, set fire to synagogues and posed for photographs in the ruins on the day after. The events of the Reich pogrom night in 1938 had even more serious consequences 
for many Jewish men, including Siegfried Gumprich, were arrested. Siegfried Gumprich was released only after he produced his emigration visa. Nonetheless, he failed in his attempt to leave the country. In January 1939, Siegfried Gumprich wrote the following to a friend who had already emigrated. We've thought of you so often and talked about how right you were to decide to emigrate so early. Sadly, we have waited too long. And now we have finally come to the conclusion that it's all the same to us where we end up. The main thing is to get out as soon as possible. Our intention to go to Trinidad has now dissolved into smoke, for Trinidad has decided to block any form of immigration. At the time when these pictures were taken in the family's garden, in spring 1939, the Gumprichs must have been in a highly desperate state. Following fresh repressions by the Nazis, they'd been forced to sell their shares in the Walter Rosa corn merchant's business. Their plans to emigrate had all come to nothing, and because of the so-called protective regulation, they no longer had free access to their bank account. This was no individual case. Many Jews were unable to find a country willing to take them. The Nazis interpreted this as an international defense measure to protect themselves from the Jewish peril. Julius Voss and his wife, who had come to Münster in January 1939, also attempted to emigrate. During the Reich pogrom night, Julius Voss had also been arrested. He was only released after producing his emigration visas for Shanghai. But he also failed in his attempt to emigrate. In January 1939, Julius Voss was the rabbi of the Jewish community and simultaneously the head of the Marx Heindorf Foundation that housed the Jewish school in Münster. By this time, all Jewish school children had been forced to leave German schools so that in 1939, the number of students attending the Marx Heindorf Foundation School rose to 43. Brigitte and Walter Gumprich also attended school here at this time. But the Marx Heindorf Foundation building served not only as a school, in April 1939, a new law forced the Jews to leave their homes and gather in houses specially designated for Jews. The building belonging to the Marx Heindorf Foundation was one of these so-called Jew houses. The Gumprich family were lucky because they were still allowed to live in their own house at the time. In April 1939, Julius Voss was the head of a Jewish community in Münster which was almost completely isolated from the other citizens of Münster and economically plundered. In the end, the Gumprich family were forced to sell their house as a result of the economic repressions imposed by the Nazi state. With the money he received from the sale of the house, Siegfried Gumprich attempted to help friends and relations to emigrate. To the President of the Supreme Tax Office, I most respectfully request you to allow me to transfer 400 marks to the Union Travel Office. The above amount is intended to enable a penniless cousin, David Israel Gumprich, to emigrate to Palestine. Siegfried Gumprich. Many such attempts to emigrate failed. These included those made by Louisa Gumprich's brother, Max Lefmann, here in the picture. After the failure of Herr Voss to emigrate with his wife from Münster, the town became a deadly trap. They had first remained in their jobs as teachers at the Marx Heindorf School until the Jewish schoolchildren were deported. But in March 1943, they too were deported to Auschwitz with their two-year-old son and murdered. The Gumprich family only narrowly escaped the same fate. On the 28th of August 1939, three days before the start of the Second World War, a Catholic priest and friend of the family brought them to the Dutch border. From there, they were able to emigrate to Great Britain, literally at the very last minute. 